Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hey, let me try that again. I want to rehearse it. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hey, hey, uh, uh, you know, pardon me for my enthusiasm, but they said, they said you will be fortunate. You'll be fortunate if you have 50 people here. Look around you. We got people. <laughs> we got far more people than that. And we got people, we got people out in their vehicles who are listening not only through the speakers but through FM. Uh, we've got, hey, we got cart people. Welcome cart people. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and man, boy, it is so good. It is so good to see you guys. Wow. Welcome, welcome, welcome back. Hey, uh, we're excited about today. We'll be here uh, for uh, the next four weeks, just like this. Uh, hopefully you're finding, uh, maybe finding some shade and finding it to be really pleasant. I'm dressed like this because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the, one of the sacrificial lambs. We're bearing the sun here, so, uh, so we're all covered up. But, uh, but I'm glad you're, are you comfortable? Yeah, you're comfortable? Okay, cool. Cool. Well, again, I am just thrilled to welcome you. Let me go over a couple of things. Uh, hopefully, uh, you didn't have any problem or wasn't much, much confusion about parking. Everybody hopefully found their spot and where they could park uh, rather easily. Uh, that's uh, at least we planned for it that way. Uh, if you have any questions about today, there are... Uh, there are section host. Uh, section host, raise your hands. Section host, raise your hands. So if you have questions, you can ask those folks, and uh, hopefully they'll be able to answer any questions that you have. Uh, for those who are in the back and who are listening on FM, uh, your, uh, your FM dial needs to be tuned in to 87.9. 87 87.9. I've always wanted to say that in the best radio voice I could. 87.9 on your radio dial. Um, so 87.9 on FM if you're listening that way. Uh, let's see, what else do I need to say? A little bit later, uh, there, are, there are buckets that are strategically placed. Uh, white buckets, I see. And uh, they're there for uh, a, a moment, a little bit later in the service when we're going to have a walk-up offering. If you have a connection card, uh, you can drop it in that bucket as well. By the way, our, I, I believe that our section host, they are not only masked, but they are gloved. And again, we're trying to make this as safe and as responsible for you as possible. If you do not have a connection, a connection card or a song sheet, and you need a song sheet, would you make sure you raise your hand, get the attention? Okay, uh, host, section host, need your attention. Yep, yep, great, thank you. Some over here, uh, here, section host right here. Thank you very much. Also, uh, if, you have, uh, if you have an elect electronic device, like a mobile phone, which most of you do, you can also get the lyrics to the songs uh, from our website. All the lyrics are there. But if you like hard copy, uh, again, we've got plenty of copies for that that you can utilize. By the way, whether you're first time or many time today because this is the first time we're getting together in what it seems like it has been months. If you have a connection card, please just indulge me this one time and please sign it and, and, and just say, hey, I was here because uh, we really do want to know that. So, uh, and a little bit later, again, when we have our walk-up offering, you can take that connection card and drop it in one of those white buckets uh, at the same time. All right? We've been saying all along that uh, things have been going on. Uh, our staff has been meeting. 
Uh, we have been doing, we've been trying to serve, serve the body. We've been trying to serve people. Uh, we've had to do it in different ways. And uh, there are things that have been going on with uh, our students. There are things that have been going on with our kids. We're going to hear a little bit about that next week. But for today, uh, I've asked Eric to share just some of the things, some of the highlights uh, of some of the things that have been going on with our students as well as why, why he's excited to uh, be together with you in this moment. All right, so give him your attention. Thank you, Ron. And just so you guys know, Ron's radio name is Roll Tide Ron. That's his little DJ name. That's what we came up with. Um, I will say this past, um, what, four or five months have been probably one of the most humbling experiences. Me being hyper-organized and wanting to be able to have all the plans all set out in stone. This has been a hard time for me, but God has been so amazing during this time. God has not only kept our numbers at about the same each and every single week, even when we're online. He's actually seen new students come into our youth group, which has been extremely exciting. And again, there's nothing that I'm doing. There's nothing that I'm doing. This is all credit to the students and how committed and dedicated they are to being at youth group every single week, whether it was online or in person. But also, it's a credit to the students of their welcoming heart, and they're wanting to grow the group and also bring in new kids. So it's been very humbling for me as a pastor to be able to be a part of that because I don't know what I'm doing half the time. I'm guessing half the time because I'm constantly changing things. So we were online for about two months and uh, that got a little old and as things started to clear up, we've been together since uh, May, around May, the end of May, we've been together doing dinners either in the backyard of my house, pool parties, been at the lake. So we have been moving and grooving and we are very excited what's happening. I've taken the kids on tours of the youth building, gotten to see what the youth room will look like in the church and all I can say is they are excited. They are beyond excited for what God is doing and I'm beyond excited to be able to lead this group and this ministry and see what these kids can do. It has been a blessing and a pleasure each and every single way. We have a few plans along the way. We're going to try to go up to Tahoe um, and go on a hike and a day trip. We're trying to do a few other things before the kids get back in school. But I will just want you guys to know one thing. I am floored at these students and how and their hearts for God and their hearts for other people. It's been amazing. I do not, I cannot explain to you why the kids keep coming back every week, uh, especially when we were on online, but I'm so glad they do. It has been a truly, truly very humbling experience for me. Um, before we uh, get ready with the worship today, I wanted to take an opportunity to be able to use our gifts. And at this time, we are going to receive our morning offering. If you are prepared to do that, we have buckets in the middle of each of the sections that you can come and you can drop your offering in there. At the same time, this would be the time, that would be the place, sorry, that you can drop that connection card that you have filled out. Other than that, guys, thank you so much for letting me get up here and share with you. I am so excited to finally get to see you guys in person, and I hope this stays this way from here and until the end of times. Thanks, guys.
All my life you have been faithful. Cause all my life you have been faithful. for me over these last few months that has just been such a beautiful reminder. It's kind of a newish song. Um, it's been out for about a year now, um, but it's called Another in, a Fi in the Fire. And I love the words of the chorus. I just wanted to read them because I know this is kind of a new one and sometimes you miss them when you're singing through them. But the chorus goes, there was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the waters holding back the seas. And if I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there's a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. And I think as, as many of us um, have experienced so much over these last few months from loss to fear to just loneliness and isolation, other things beyond, you know, what we're dealing with with the pandemic um, that has just really hit home. And we found ourselves in these situations where we feel alone or we don't have this beautiful community that God planted us in to just do life with. Um, it's been a great reminder to me and my family that even in those moments of being alone, that he is right there with us and that he is good and that he loves us. So jump in and sing it if you know it. And if not, hopefully you'll learn it by the end and it'll speak to you the way it has spoken to me. There's a grace when the heart is undefined Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and it's wrecking me Another in the fire Standing next to me There was another 
walking through any of this alone. We're going to do one more. It's usually one that I start with, but I thought it'd be a great way to kind of end our time of worship here together this morning. Just rejoicing in the power that is Jesus. Yes. Your name is power. 
the darkness, it's freedom for the captive, mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, it's glory in the struggle. Hey, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, oh, man, I'm excited about this day. Um, one, because I, I get to see you, uh, even though you're hidden. But I do get to see you. Uh, and uh, and I, I get to preach. And I've got, man, I tell you, uh, several weeks ago, God began to lay on my heart uh, doing a series in the book of Daniel. And Becky, I didn't, I didn't tell you I was going to be preaching on Daniel, did I? Wow, I love it. I love it when the master conductor brings things together. Because if you know anything about the book of Daniel, there is a moment that there's a fire. And, and for her to pick this song, which I had never heard before, so I went, a couple of these songs were new. And I hope that you were encouraged by these songs. By the way, uh, if they were new to you, go back again. Look at the lyrics. Uh, the lyrics are on our website as well. Uh, wow, I got to tell you, the, the lyrics for such a time as this that we're living, they will, they will bless you. They will bless you. But anyway, so, um, so then to think about this song and to think about this uh, series that we're launching into today in the book of Daniel. Uh, and I love, by the way, I love the progression of, of the lyrics of that song, Another in the Fire. There, there was, there was another in the fire. There, there is another in the fire. Now let, these are just a progression of the stanzas. And there will be. Oh, man, I don't know if this is loud. Is this getting out there or what, man? Uh, <laughs> there was, there is, there will be. Man, that's God. That is God. And, and so, yeah, I'm, I am excited about today. The year, the year was 155 A.D. The setting was the Roman Colosseum. The central figure is an elderly disciple of Jesus. His name is Polycarp. He's the leader of a church in an area that was known as Smyrna. It's the same Smyrna that the Apostle John refers to in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2. By this moment in time, Polycarp has become the leader. He's become like the father of the church in Smyrna. And one of the things that John the Apostle tells those believers there in Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2 is this as he prophesies to them. You know, when we think about prophesying over people, we think about all that is good and all that feels good. But when John prophesied over the church in Smyrna, this is what he said. He said, clouds are gathering. And times are going to get hard. And some of you are going to be put in prison. And some of you will suffer for the faith to the point of death. And then he said this, be faithful to the end. Be faithful to the end. And John was one of those that helped to influence and disciple Polycarp. And no doubt in this moment in 155 AD, as he is being ushered into the Roman Colosseum, those words are ringing loud and clear in his mind. Be faithful to the end. You see, days before, bounty hunters who had been in pursuit of Polycarp finally caught up to him. It's interesting what happens next. Instead of running or trying to escape, he actually invites them in to dinner. He serves them dinner. 
And then he asks them, he makes one request of them, give me one hour please for prayer. After about two hours, he emerges. And he discovers to his delight that many within that party had repented just by hearing Polycarp pray through those hours. But they had a mission. And they were determined to complete the mission. So they take him back to the authorities. The Roman council implore him at that point to renounce his faith to renounce Christ, to recant his faith in Jesus. Swear by the genius of Caesar, they said, and we will release you. Revile the Christ. His response was this, 86 years I've served Him, and He's done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my King who saved me? The crowd in the Colosseum begins to chant, for the wild lions to devour him. But they decide instead to burn him at the stake. So they bind him to the stake. And they put all the things that are necessary. They light the pile that is there before him. And his last prayer is heard to be something like this. Thank you, Father, for honoring me among those martyrs who have given everything for your service. To you be glory. Both now and forevermore. So they light the pile. The, the flames consume him. But the flames don't burn him. And there, in that time, for that time, there is a modern day Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Instead of the, the smell, the stench of human flesh being consumed by fire, there is, there is an emission of frankincense that waffles through the Colosseum. Finally, one of the executioners takes a spear and thrusts it through Polycarp's body, and he bleeds out. But not, but not until he has been faithful to the end. And not until he can say before his God, I have played the part you've called me to play. We come to a book in the Old Testament. It is a book, I tell you, it is a book full of intrigue. It is a book full of mystery. It is, man, it is a modern day read, I'm telling you. You read the book of Daniel and you're going to see all kinds of beast and you're going to have you're going to see beasts with all kinds of horns growing out of their heads and you're going to scratch your head and you're going to say what in the world is this this is sci-fi on steroids but there are visions that Daniel has and there are visions that Daniel interprets and over time over the next few weeks we're going to attempt to see what some of these things mean as Daniel sees, not only in the time that he's living, and not only the immediate future, but as he sees all the way to the future, the end of time. And as God uses him to reveal these things. But today I want to talk about, not about those things. Today I want to talk about again, the man who is central to this book by the name of Daniel. Daniel's name comes from two root words. One word means God. The other word means to judge. So when you begin to think about Daniel, basically his name means God is my judge. In other words, what Daniel, what Daniel conveys to us is this. You know, it's not the person sitting next to you that's your judge. Some of you may be really glad of that. It's not, it's, it's, it's not the people that are at your work. It's, it's, it's none of those folks. Now, they may judge you. And they will judge you. But they're not your final judge. God, God is the one who's keeping the record. And God keeps the record according to His righteousness. God keeps the record according to His standard. Daniel reminds us of that. And Daniel, being reminded of that, lives accordingly. Because Daniel served under five different kings in his time. 
Starting with the one we're going to see here in chapter 1. In other words, in our day and time, it would be like saying he served under five different administrations. But Daniel, throughout all of those, was consistent and he was faithful because he believed that God is his judge. And you know, when you begin to really believe that God is your judge, you will begin to alter your life according to that. You will live again according to what God declares is right, what God declares is wrong. It's awfully quiet. I don't know if you're saying amen or if you're... It's a little bit bright and not very loud up here. But when you, get, when you really begin to believe that, your life is altered by that truth. God's my judge. God is the one who will determine how my life stacks up, how my life has been faithful. It's God. In chapter 1, in fact, if I, were if I were titling it, in fact, if I were titling the whole book, I would probably title it like this. Will you stand? Will you stand when all others are bowing? And I, I, I kind of, I, I kind of, I, I don't know, I played with that title a little bit <laughs> because of the time in which we're living. Because I don't want that to come across in any way political. That's not meant to be political. I hope that it's meant to be a prophetic word in our moment, in our time, the time in which we live. The time in which I tell you, again, I believe, I am praying, and I hope you're praying, I am praying for a mighty revival in this world. I'm praying for revival. I am praying for revival and renewal in our church. I'm praying for revival and renewal beginning in my own heart. I'm praying for revival in your heart, so watch out. I'm praying for revival in our church, in our community, in our state, in our nation. But I am praying that God will one more time, one more time, do something globally such as the church of Jesus Christ has yet to see. Where the lost are coming to Christ. Where those who are broken by life are healed by the power of Christ. The power of His name. We just sang about it. I hope you're praying that way. I'm praying that way. And I'm believing that way. But let me tell you something else. While that is going on, I cannot help but see, and I can't ignore the clouds that are gathering around us. Again, I think about, again, how John prophesied over the church at Smyrna. I don't know. Are we living in that time? Are we living in a time when clouds are gathering? Are we living in a time when persecution is about to come? I don't know. I can tell you that persecution is occurring right as we sit here in many parts of the world to the church of Jesus Christ. But while we have these times and while we have this opportunity to be outside and to you, for you to be able to hear without any interference whatsoever, of those and the threat of those coming in and shutting this down. We need to connect with God and go deep with God as we have yet to go. This is the time. Will you stand when all others are bowing? If you have a copy of the Bible, probably most of you have it on your smartphone, take it and turn to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1, and I want to begin, I, I want to read just nine verses here in Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. So here are the Babylonians being led by Nebuchadnezzar. And they're coming in and they're taking Jerusalem. They have conquering Jerusalem. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. By the way, from chapter 1, listen, there are 12 chapters. There are 12 chapters in the book of Daniel. 
And if you want to know some of the theology of Daniel, here's one of the things you need to understand about Daniel. Daniel absolutely tells us about the sovereignty of God. God is in control. Now, I don't know what that does to you, but that gives me hope. God's in control. Do you know that this, this, this COVID virus didn't take God off guard? God is in control. And God will see all things toward the end whereby He has purposed them. God's in control. You know that the Scriptures teach us that God is the one who holds the hearts of kings in His hand. And He turns them as He desires. I think that's interesting because it says in verse 2, how was it, uh, let me ask you, how was it that Jehoiakim came about being defeated by Nebuchadnezzar? Are you almost afraid to say it? Because God, God allowed that to happen. God allowed that to happen. God gave Jehoiakim over. And here's one of the things that we need to understand, that we need to understand about God. While we absolutely emphasize and preach the mercy and the kindness and the grace and the love of God, God is also a God of justice. God is also, His heart is so big that His heart is absolutely broken and grieved by sin. Rebellion absolutely wrecks Him. We need to understand that. Time and time again, you see Him reasoning with His people and here it is, this, this again, because, by the way, Daniel is a contemporary, write this down if you don't, I will write it in your mind. Daniel is a contemporary of Ezekiel and Jeremiah. There's about a 31-year period of time where, where their ministries, their prophecies all overlap, okay? So if you want to know something and understand something about the time, you, you can go and look at those prophets as well. There are others, Nahum, Zephaniah, others who are prophesying during the, But they're all prophesying a, about a common theme. And the common theme is this. Israel represent God's people. You've had so much. God has blessed you. God has blessed you and favored you so very much. But what have you done with what God has blessed you with? And so many times, they had taken what God had blessed them with and forsaken it, squandered it, turned away from it, rebelled against it. There is a point. There is a point when the long suffering of God comes to an end. We need to understand this. It doesn't mean that God's not loving. There is a time when the long suffering of God comes to an end and God allows us to have what it is that we demand we have. But how many of, how many of us have found that in those moments of time when it is that God has allowed me to have what it is that I have demanded to have, the consequences weren't what I imagined them to be. We see that in this time. And so as we open the pages of Daniel, the nation has gotten what they demanded, life free of God's interference. And be certain of this, that again, while God is long-suffering and longs for relationship with us, there is a point when God will allow the hardness of our own hearts to have what it desires. And so... They are living with the consequences of that. Daniel, again, was a contemporary of Ezekiel and Jeremiah. So, notice what it goes on to say. So they've been taken away to this new land. That was common. Uh, the best of the young adults were recruited to be upplanted out of their native land 
and replanted in the capital of the conquering, the conquering army. And there they went through a period of what you might call re-education. A period of indoctrination into the ways of their conquering army. When I, when I think about that, I am reminded that there is very much an enemy of our soul. There very much is an enemy of your soul. And he has not listened to me. And especially I want to say this to our young people who are able to hear me now. He is not only content, he is not only content to marginalize your effectiveness for Christ, he wants to absolutely destroy you by re-educating you, by indoctrinating you into the ways of His world, into the ways of darkness, so that what once was evil is now good, and what was once good is now evil. And we see this being played out. Another way to think about it is this. God, as the redeemed of God, God has given you a new identity. How many of you know that? Oh, that, man, I'm not impressed. Let me say that one more time. As the redeemed of God, God has given you a new identity. How many of you know that? How now? <laughs> Thank you for the horn shout. Um, so not only has He given you a new identity, but the whole purpose of that new identity is that you live out of that new identity. It is your new man. It is your new purpose for life. But you know as well as I do that, again, fighting against that, seeking to rob you of that new identity is the world around you. Because the world around you, the enemy of your soul, is going to constantly remind you of what you once were. It is going to say things like, you can't, you can't be anything else but what you once were. While God's Spirit is saying, no, that's not what you are. It's the same thing that the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians when he talked about all kinds of categories of sin and habitual sin, and he says this. These are the beautiful words of Paul in, in 1 Corinthians. And such were. Did you hear that? Such were some of you. So we get to this point. So they are carried off to Babylon. And then the king ordered Ashpenaz. This is verse 3. The chief of his officials to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles. Used in whom there was no, no physical defect, who were good looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding, discerning knowledge. I mean, th this was the cream of the crop. And they were ordered for three years to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. And the king also appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food. And what you need to understand about the king's choice food is that the king's choice food and the wine were, were at some point in a ceremony all, all offered and dedicated, dedicated to pagan gods. Part of this was a way of, at least in their belief, of protecting the king from harm. So it was all again offered to a false god. Now Daniel understood that. And that's why we're going to see Daniel refusing to take that king's portion of meat every day. Now notice, now among them were the sons of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, and then the commander of the officials assigned new names. Again, your identity in Christ your identity in Christ and who you are as a child of God, who you are as a daughter of God, a son of God, redeemed of the Lord, filled full of the Holy Spirit, sealed by the Holy Spirit, more than a conqueror through Him who loved you. That's, that's going to be challenged as you live in this world. So we see them assigning them new names. And the new names are, as, as you know, Belshazzar for Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego for the other three. 
But verse 8, listen to this. Here it is. Here it is. Will you stand? Will you stand when everyone else is bowing? But Daniel made up his mind. Another translation might say, Daniel purposed in his heart. Daniel was resolute. Had nothing to do with the way the wind was blowing. Daniel had thought this through carefully. And whether you're here today as a teenager or 20-something, 30-something, just go all the way down the list. What's going to determine, what is going to determine whether or not you will stand in a day when everyone else is bowing is whether or not you have thought your faith clearly through. Because once you have thought it through, you can, like Daniel, be resolute regardless, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the times, regardless if you see dark clouds gathering, you will stand that's Daniel. And by the way, isn't it somewhat amazing? I think it's somewhat amazing that Daniel does this. He's about 15 years old at this point. Somebody shout. Somebody give a shout for teenagers. Now everybody give a shout for teenagers. Everybody. Serious business. Do they have a place at the table? Come on! Daniel's about 15 years old at this point. And he's about to be called in after these three years of indoctrination. He is about to be called in before King Nebuchadnezzar who has his dream and nobody can interpret for him. And it's going to be Daniel. He's going to be about 18 years old at that point. Wow! But here he is, full of faith, full of courage. When everyone else is bowing down, Daniel says, I'll stand. Oh, I hope, listen, regardless of your age today, I hope you'll understand that now is your time. Now is your time. Now is your time. And then there's that moment. There's that moment. By the way, this is for everyone. Because if you want to know something else that I find incredibly, incredibly exciting about Daniel, do you know, do you know that when Daniel was marched off to become lunch for lions, he was in his early 80s. He was in his early 80s. So here's a lifetime. Here's a lifetime of being faithful and to stand when others are bowing. I, I, I've wondered, what, 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 what was it? I mean, I get it. I get it that Daniel's heart was there. And he, he was resolute in his mind. Resolute in his own heart. Make sure you get that down. He purposed in his own heart. He was determined in his own mind. He had made that decision. But here's the thing. When I think about that, yes, I understand the work of the Holy Spirit in bringing that to pass. But what is it? What else was there, do you think? And now, now, now I know that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of stepping out on a limb here. But when I think about the way that a, a, a Jewish family was put together and, and the commands of moms and dads to influence their kids and to talk about God as they're, as they're going about daily life and to doing these things both at the table as well as when they're going to the Walmart and all that kind of stuff, I get it. You'll get that later. Uh, I, I get it that, that there, there I, I, I don't know, I just believe that there was another influence. It was the powerful influence of Daniel's mom and dad who had a powerful influence upon his life and upon his character that shaped him for this moment. And I'm, I'm passionate about that because I'm telling you we're living in a time when mom's and dad's influence in the family is being marginalized all the time. And I want to say to you moms and dads, and by way of extension, if you want to, if you want to receive this as a grandmother, as a grandfather, receive it. You are a primary shaper and influencer of everything 
faith-wise that goes on in your home. Rise up. Rise up. And I think Daniel saw that. Uh, let me end with this story. The time now is 1927. The place is Long Island, New York. It's about 8 o'clock in the morning when a 25-year-old pilot enters a, a single-seat, single-engine airplane. And he's going to attempt to do something that others had attempted but failed to do. A transatlantic flight all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. He almost runs out of runway before he gets airborne. But by that point it's too late because the plane had no brakes. I'm speaking of Charles Lindbergh. 33 hours later. How long? 33 hours, 30 minutes later. He lands in Paris, France to an overwhelming response. And he immediately becomes like, like this, this global icon. He did it. You read the stories, you read the stories of what he took, the little water, the few ham sandwiches that he had along. I think about the fact that he flew at times as low as 10 feet above the ocean surface. But he did it. I think about, can you imagine, can you imagine those long hours? That night, at night? The darkness of the sea, the darkness of the sky, as he flew through those long, grueling hours? But he did it. And, 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 and I think, well, what in the world? How was it that, that he persevered? How was it that he was able to overcome in those moments again where all he saw around him was dark? By the way, he had no instrument panel. He had a Boy Scout compass. <laughs> but he had no instrument panel. Oh, you're not going to... Can you, can you imagine... And so what was it? Here's the question. What is it in a, man, in a man's composition? What is it that's down in a man's heart? What is it that's down in a person's character? It's that in that moment when it is hard that they rise up to the moment. I may be off here, but it, could it be? Could it be that he thought of his grandfather? His grandfather was August, August Lindbergh. August Lindbergh came here as a Swedish immigrant. Couldn't speak a lick of English. He got a job at a sawmill in Minnesota. There was that day when he got caught in the saw. And the saw literally mangled his midsection, so much so that one eyewitness said, I could see his beating heart. He had this gaping hole. He eventually lost his arm. By the way, he went home. He was able to get home. He waited three days for a doctor. But he endured. When the doctor finally got there, they took off his arm, sewed up the hole, and maybe hoped that somehow he would survive. Well, indeed he did. Allow me, if you will, allow me, if you will, to maybe just speculate that there was a moment when grandfather and grandson are talking about life. Maybe there's that moment when grandfather and grandson are talking about his dreams and about what it is that he's going to attempt to do. And grandfather can speak with credibility to talk about how you endure through hardship how you, can, how you can stand when everyone else is bowing. Today, we're living, and maybe this gets overused, but we're living in unprecedented times. 
we're, I, I, I know I'm certainly living in times that I've never experienced before in my lifetime. So where is God to be found in all of this? And I would say to you that God is to be found all over the place. For those, listen, for those who are looking, for those who are searching with all of their heart because He longs to be found. Will you be? Will you be strong when it seems like all others are weak? Will you stand for that which is right when it seems that all others have lost their minds? Will you stand for Christ to the very end? We need to be like Daniel. Purpose in our minds and our hearts that we will be that person. Let's pray. Becky, would you come? You guys come. Randy. Father, uh, come into the quietness of this moment. Lord Jesus, Uh, whereas we say and I say this is unprecedented I've never been through uh, there's nothing new according to your word there's nothing new under the sun the church your people your faithful people your faithful followers have seen stuff like this before and I'm grateful that we have examples that we have models of those who have endured to the end Praise the Lord. And God, my prayer is that in this time and in this season, you will find, come on, that you will find a new generation who will live faithfully to the very end. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you're great. It's, it's so good to see all of you again. Let's, let's do another, another in the fire. Um, I know that, again, it's a new song. But I'm going to ask that we stand. Because <clears throat> as soon as we sing this song, our, our service is done. Did I, did I say it's so good to see you again? <laughs> let's stand. And... Um, I'm bringing Becky back. Having heard what you, listen, having heard what you just heard, I, my prayer in this moment right now is that you will hear this song in a whole new, uh, in a whole new fresh way. Another in the fire. When you stand, when all others are bowing, you're not standing alone. You're not standing alone. You're not standing alone. God is with you. God is with you. Listen to this. There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between
Again, uh, thanks for coming out. See you next Sunday. Bring someone with you. Huge shout out to our deacons who helped to put everything in place. Our, our parking volunteer, all our parking volunteers, uh, particularly uh, to AJ and Joshua. Uh, we had someone else there with uh, sound. Uh, who else did we? Matthew, yeah, Matthew, all, all of those, again, so many who volunteered today. Hey, thank you so much for making this happen. God bless you. Yeah.